Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to Science on Tap. Uh, and Happy New Year to everybody. Hope you all had a great holiday. Uh, we're delighted to be back with you for the new year, um, back to the Monaco Brewing Company and back to Science on Tap. So thanks for coming. My name is Susan Knight. I work at the UW Trout Lake Station up the road a bit. And uh, Science on Tap is an example of the Wisconsin idea where the borders of the university are the borders of the state. And here you don't get a lecture, you get um, some opening comments and then we open it up so that everybody can ask questions um, that they might have. And just to remind you about our partners that um, bring you Science on Tap, it's the University of Wisconsin Trout Lake Station, the University of Wisconsin-Madison Kemp Natural Resources Station, and uh, the Lakeland Badger Chapter of the Wisconsin Alumni Association, Monaco Public Library, and our hosts here, the Monaco Brewing Company. So thanks to everybody. And we are also funded by a, um, the Brittingham Fund, a foundation, a UW-Madison Foundation Fund that has been very generous to us through the years. We just heard they, they uh, gave us money again. So we're good, we're good to go. <laughs> and... There are uh, four ways to watch. You guys are all watching right here, which is great. You can also watch at the library over with uh, um, Mary Taylor. Or you can watch from home if you've got a good enough internet connection. And also we tape everything and also make a short, uh, a 10 minute short of the entire presentation each time. That it takes a month or so before those are available, but lots of ways to, to participate. Um, our next Science on Tap event will be February 6th, and our speaker will be Malika Nako, talking about using our water for irrigating agriculture. So she's going to be talking about all the um, irrigation wells, especially down in the Central Sands area of the state. So that should be pretty interesting. Uh, competing uses for our water. Tonight we have Edna Chang. Edna is a PhD candidate in the microbial doctoral training program at UW-Madison. And Edna grew up in Rochester Hills, Michigan, a Detroit suburb. She did her undergrad at the University of Michigan in Ar Ann Arbor. We mustn't hold that against her now. <laughs> As an undergraduate, she became interested in microbes um, living in the Great Lakes and how they contributed to nutrient cycling and keeping the Great Lakes in the health of the Great Lakes. When she started grad school, she wanted to explore the role of microbes in other natural environments, and she became enamored with hibernating ground squirrels. Edna is a National Science Foundation graduate research fellow and a Wisconsin IDEA STEM fellow. She works with Dr. Hannah Carey, professor of comparative biosciences, to study the symbiosis between hibernating mammals and their gut micro microorganisms. Both hibernators and their microbes experience extreme changes in diet and physiology throughout the year, which inspires many interesting questions. Some of these questions might be, how is hibernation different from sleeping? And how do hibernators and their gut microbes work together to survive the winter? And someone might ask her, what does any of this have to do with traveling in space? So I don't know what that is. All right, here's your trivia question. Last summer, Edna traveled to Leipzig, Germany for a microbi microbial ecology conference. One evening, there was a large disturbance across the street from her hotel. What was going on? A, a 550-pound Bengal tiger had escaped from the zoo and was walking down the street. B, some construction workers found a 550-pound undetonated bomb left over from World War II. Or C, some robbers blew a hole in the back of a museum and robbed a priceless 550-pound chunk of copper. It was the bomb. Edna. All right. All right. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Susan. Um, the thing that I might not have mentioned to you is that uh, right down the street from my hotel was actually where the Leipzig Zoo was. So <laughs> it might not be out of the realm of possibilities that a 550-pound tiger escaped from that. 
Um, but thank you for that introduction, and thank you, everyone, for having me here tonight. So this is my first time doing a talk like this, where it's you know a casual discussion based with the audience, so I'm really excited to be here. Um, and this is also the first time that I've been this far up north in Wisconsin. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> So I really wanted to get a chance to appreciate the beauty of the Northwoods. So I got here yesterday, did some hiking yesterday, did some hiking this morning, and I have really been enjoying myself up here. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so tonight I'm really excited to be able to talk to you about hibernation, how hibernators survive the winter, how their gut microorganisms are involved in this process, and what all of this can mean for applications in space travel and human medicine. So hibernation is a strategy that some animals will use to survive times of high energy demand um, and low resource availability, just like the cold winter that's happening right now outside those doors. In order to survive the winter, an animal needs to consume enough food and water to provide it with enough energy so that it can fuel its body and stay warm. And there are a variety of strategies that animals use to accomplish this. Some animals, like geese, will simply choose to leave behind the cold and they'll migrate south to warmer weather. But this means that they spend an enormous amount of energy completing that arduous journey down south. Other animals, like the tree squirrel, will choose to stay where they are, um, stay where they are and then they will prepare for winter by storing food during summer and fall and then eat that food throughout winter. So tree squirrels, like gray squirrels, um, are the squirrels with the big fluffy tails that you'll often see running up and down trees and hiding nuts. But their strategy means that they are still consciously dealing with the cold on a day-to-day -day basis. The reason that I find hibernation such an interesting survival strategy is because it allows animals to stay where they're at, but it minimizes how much they're consciously dealing with the cold. And hibernating mammals are a very diverse group. So you have marsupials that hibernate, you even have egg-laying mammals that hibernate. Um, and interesting enough, there are actually primates who hibernate, two species to be exact. However, my hibernator of choice and the one that I study is the 13-line ground squirrel. So this isn't the tree squirrel with the big fluffy tail. As I just mentioned, tree squirrels choose to store food rather than hibernate. Instead, 13-line ground squirrels live in underground burrows, and they look like oversized chipmunks, but with 13 lines on their back. That's their name. Um, and these squirrels do hibernate. In fact, they're probably hibernating in your backyard right now because they're native to Wisconsin and to the Midwest. And if any of you are farmers or gardeners, you're likely acquainted with them because they tend to be pests and will wreak havoc on anything you try to grow in the ground. So today, I'm really excited to share with you two stories about hibernation based on the work that my lab and I do studying these 13 line ground squirrels. The first story is going to be about how the squirrel host survives winter. The second story is going to be about how their gut microorganisms survive the winter. And my first story about the squirrel host begins during the season of summer, a time of plentitude and feasting. These squirrels need to consume an immense amount of food because they need to build up adequate fat stores that they can later use for energy throughout hibernation. So uh, by the end of the summer, a squirrel will typically double its body weight. Once the weather starts getting colder, that's when the squirrel will begin to hibernate. And during this time, the squirrel doesn't eat anything. It doesn't drink anything for six months of the year, which is pretty crazy if you think about this dramatic contrast between the summer feasting period versus this winter fasting period. So throughout hibernation, the squirrel is in a sleep-like state and it relies primarily on those fat stores that it built up during the summer to fuel it through the winter. And that's how the squirrel survives, is using that fat store. Well, actually, if the squirrel was just sleeping for six months of the year, it would run into quite a few health problems. So sleeping puts the body at rest, and it decreases metabolism, the engine that runs the body but it doesn't decrease metabolism enough for those fat stores to last those full six months, which means that these squirrels will run out of fuel and starve before the end of winter. Since they're fasting, they're not eating any food, so that means there's no other way for them to gain energy to fuel their body. And fasting in and of itself can cause a few problems. So during fasting, there is no solid, no liquid moving through the gastrointestinal tract or the GI tract. And this disuse of the GI tract leads to gut atrophy, 
the structure of the gut, especially the mucosa that lines and protects the GI tract, that starts to degrade, which leads to a leaky gut. And this also contributes to a weakened immune system. And just like the GI tract degrades because it's not being used, the same thing happens to muscle and bone. The squirrel is sleeping, so it's not engaging in a lot of physical activity, which means that muscle and bone atrophy and leave the squirrel extremely weak. So then how in the world does this 13-line ground squirrel overcome all of these problems that arise with sleeping for a long duration of time? Well, it comes down to the fact that hibernation is much more complicated than just sleep. There are similarities between the two, though. So both hibernating animals and sleeping mammals are unconscious, and they both experience a decrease in metabolism and body temperature. The difference, though, is that hibernation takes these changes to a much more extreme level. But you can think of these two states as being on the same continuum of changes in metabolism. On one end, the more extreme end is hibernating animals, and then on the other end of less extreme changes is sleeping animals. During hibernation, um, the majority of the time is spent in a state called torpor, which uh, refers to decreased metabolism or metabolic depression. Um, and in 13-line ground squirrels, when they're in torpor, their metabolism can decrease by up to 96%, which causes their body temperature to also decrease dramatically. So a squirrel's normal body temperature is the same as ours, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. In torpor, however, it drops all the way down to 39 degrees Fahrenheit. So just a couple of degrees above freezing. Um, and if you didn't think that that was crazy enough, there are actually some hibernators, like the Arctic ground squirrel, whose body temperature in torpor drops below freezing, so all the way down to 27 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's one end of the extreme changes in metabolism. If we contrast this to what sleeping humans do, our metabolism only decreases slightly. And when we're asleep, our body temperature only drops by one degree. So these changes that we see in hibernators are very extreme changes. And it's these dramatic decreases in metabolism and body temperature that allow the squirrel to conserve an enormous amount of energy. And that's what allows them to subsist off their fat stores for the full six months of hibernation. Now, the end of hibernation is marked with the arrival of spring. Um, and by that point in time, a squirrel will lose an average of one-third of its body weight, but this can get as high as one-half of its body weight. So you can see how hibernation is a very energetically intensive survival strategy. But nevertheless, these hibernators have survived, and they've done so by decreasing their metabolism and using a survival strategy that's characterized by cycling um, between torpor um, and another state, actually. So torpor isn't the only thing that happens during hibernation. Um, torpor lasts about 1 to 24 days, um, depending on how deep into the winter season the squirrel is. But it's interrupted by periods that we call interbout arousals. Um, and these interbout arousals occur when the squirrel's metabolism and body temperature return back to normal rates. That will last 12 to 24 hours, after which the squirrel will then re-enter torpor. Um, now, you may imagine that these interbout arousals are extremely energetically expensive, right? Metabolism is going back to normal. And in fact, over 70% of the energy used during hibernation is caused by these, is used during these interbout arousals. Um, so that naturally brings up the question of why do these arousals occur? Um, and why is it necessary for successful hibernation? Well, these are some of the biggest questions that remain in the field of hibernation. And we don't have an answer yet, although we have a lot of hypotheses as scientists, um, but those still need to be tested further. Um, however, what we do think is that these interbout arousals play an important role in minimizing some of those health effects that I had mentioned earlier. So minimizing a weakened immune system and minimizing muscle atrophy. And the hallmark of hibernation really is the cycling between torpor to interbout arousal, which occurs throughout those six months of hibernation. So when a squirrel loses half of its body weight during hibernation, most of that is due to those interbout arousals. Um, but when spring rolls around, the squirrel is able to resume its normal metabolic activity and feeding patterns, and that's actually when its mating season begins. So the squirrels naturally cycle between these periods of feasting and fasting being active, and hibernating. And they do this every single year. But they're not alone when they do this. 
Hibernators and almost all other animals on Earth live in a symbiosis with trillions of microorganisms living in and on them. Um, and this microbial community, or microbiome, has become a popular topic in recent years. I'm sure many of you um, have heard about ways that you can take care of your own gut microbiome. So, for example, taking probiotics like yogurt to enrich your gut and microbes that aid in digestion. Um, or taking prebiotics like fiber to help encourage the growth of beneficial microbes. And it's this microbiome that's the topic around which my second story is about. So everything that we experience is also experienced by our microbiome. And from the perspective of a hibernator, this means that all of those extreme natural changes in diet and physiology that the squirrel experiences are also dramatic changes in the environment of their microbiome. And this is why I find studying the hibernator microbiome so fascinating. There's always a new challenge around the corner that the microbes need to overcome and adapt to in order to survive. So from the perspective of the microbes, um, any food that the squirrel consumes is food that they can use for energy. Um, and this is especially prevalent during summer when the squirrel is consuming a lot of food. That microbes have access to all of this as a rich source of energy. However, the microbiome runs into some challenges as soon as the squirrel starts to hibernate. The squirrel starts fasting, which means that the microbes have now lost an important source of energy. The squirrel's body temperature also decreases which causes a drastic change in the microbes' environment. Most microorganisms that live inside a host are used to growing at warm temperatures. So in the case of both the ground squirrel and us, this is growing at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. But in torpor, that body temperature in a squirrel drops down to 39 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is such a drastic change that many microbes simply are unable to adapt to this and survive. So what this all means is all of these changes combined cause a huge die-off of microorganisms in hibernating squirrels compared to summer active squirrels. Many microbes simply cannot adapt to all of these changes and survive. So then that brings up the question of, for the microorganisms that do survive, how do they survive? How do they deal with the cold and how do they obtain energy? Um, and this is the question that I really get excited about as a microbiologist. So there are a few strategies that the microbes can use. Um, they can opt to go into their own hibernation-like state. So the decrease in body temperature of their squirrel host causes a decrease in the microbes' metabolism. And in some microbes, they decrease metabolism so much that they go into a state of dormancy, just like the squirrels go into a state of torpor. And some of these dormant microbes even take it a step further they will form protective structures um, called spores in which they'll stay during these difficult times. And these spores keep them safe until the environment becomes favorable again, at which time they can break out and start growing. But what about the microbes that don't go into this dormant state? Well, lucky for them, they still have a source of energy. And this often comes in the form of substrates that they derive from their squirrel host. So the mucosa that lines the GI tract, that can be used for energy. Um, the cells that line the GI tract, when these die, the host will slough them up, it, slough them off into the GI tract, and that can also be used by the microbes. And that huge die-off of microbes I mentioned that occurs in hibernating squirrels, well, all of those microbial carcasses are also a rich source of energy. So the microbes are able to survive torpor by using these various substrates and by going to a dormant state. Uh, but I think it's also worth mentioning that all of these substrates that I'm mentioning right now that they can use during hibernation, they don't just exist during hibernation. They actually exist year-round. So even in the summer when the squirrel's eating a lot of food, microbes can either eat that food or they can opt to use these host-derived substrates, which I think just shows you one of the reasons that I find the microbiome so enticing to study. They're extremely diverse and they can metabolize a wide variety of substrates, so there's so much diversity that we can discover there and learn from. But as you all know, torpor isn't the only thing that happens during hibernation. So what happens when a squirrel enters an interbout arousal? Well, the squirrel's body temperature warms up, which is good for the microbes, because now their environment is back at a temperature that they're used to growing at. The squirrel's metabolism increases, which also means that they're likely um, secreting more of these substrates that the microbes can use for energy. So for those short 12 to 24 hours, the microbes are in a much more favorable environment where they can grow. 
But as soon as that squirrel enters torpor again, the microbes need to learn to adapt quickly to those changes. Um, so you can see that hibernation is a really dynamic sis, uh, system or survival strategy that the squirrels use, which means that the microbes are in this very constantly changing environment and they need to learn to adapt to that to survive. But it's their diversity and their various stra uh, survival strategies that allows them to survive in hibernation. Um, and you really, you can think about hibernation as something that we often do as humans. Um, so I know the winter holidays just passed and I'm sure many of us went on trips to either visit family or to go on vacation. And I bet most of us, when we left home, turned down the thermostat and turned down the water heater. Not enough for the pipes to freeze, of course, but enough to save energy while our house was still functioning. So just like we turned down the thermostat to save energy, hibernators will turn down and decrease their metabolism and body temperature to save energy. So I've now told you two stories about hibernation. Um, and it's important to remember that there are two sides of the same coin. Microbes and their hosts are always working together to survive and benefit each other. Microbes will often use substrates that they obtain from their host for energy, um, and in exchange, they'll produce compounds that the host can then use for energy themselves. And a great example of this is some work that my lab and I are doing to help address the question of why do we not see muscle atrophy in hibernators? So they're sleeping, not participating in a lot of physical activity, and they're not eating any protein or eating any food. So how in the world are they maintaining all of that muscle mass? Well, their gut microbiome likely plays an important role. Um, and that's because microbes can recycle nitrogen, which is a key component of amino acids and proteins. So nitrogen in mammals is excreted in metabolic waste in the form of urea, which is a component of urine. The gut microbiome, however, can take that urea and convert it into ammonia, a different form of nitrogen. And this ammonia can be used by both the gut microbes and their host um, for synthesizing amino acids and proteins. Um, so by recycling this host metabolic waste, they are able to benefit themselves by providing themselves with nitrogen. But they're also able to benefit the host by providing them with a way to maintain their muscle mass. And this is just one of many examples of how microorganisms and their host work together to benefit each other. But then the question is, what does any of this have to do with space travel or human medicine? So let's start out with space travel, because that's my personal favorite application of hibernation research. Um, so when we talk space travel, I'm talking about being able to induce synthetic torpor in astronauts or other organisms. Synthetic torpor being a hibernation-like state of metabolic depression. If we were able to induce synthetic torpor, that means that we could not only save a considerable amount of energy and resources, but we could also increase the safety for the involved participants. And I know hibernating astronauts sounds pretty far-fetched and kind of science fiction, um, but there really are a lot of similarities between sleep and hibernation that make inducing synthetic torpor a real possibility. Now, I know we can't expect us to drop our body temperature down to just a few degrees above freezing, but we can look to larger hibernators for more relevant answers about what synthetic torpor would look like in a human. So let's take the brown bear, for example. Um, the brown bear, when they hibernate, does not drop their body temperature all the way down to 39 degrees Celsius, or 39 degrees Fahrenheit like the brown squirrel. Brown bears drop their body temperature from 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit to 86 degrees Fahrenheit. So only about a 10 degree difference. But this still translates to a decrease in metabolism. Why? Well, it's down to the fact that brown bears are much larger than a ground squirrel. Um, and because of that, brown bears have a smaller surface area to volume ratio, which means that they can retain energy more efficiently. So even just a 10 degree decrease in their body temperature translates into a significant decrease in metabolism, up to 75% actually. So synthetic torpor in a human would likely be similar to what we see in a brown bear. We would decrease our body temperature by just a couple degrees, um, but we would be able to save a lot of energy by decreasing metabolism. Um, so, and by doing this successfully, that means that astronauts would use less food, water, and oxygen. And it also means that astronauts would be less susceptible to health problems associated with space travel. So, for example, this would minimize damage caused by space radiation um, or minimize bone loss and muscle atrophy from microgravity. 
And the benefits of synthetic torpor don't only apply to long duration space travel. Um, they actually have a lot of benefits for short term situations as well. So let me give you a hypothetical situation. Let's say we have a space crew at the International Space Station and they're preparing for a journey back home to Earth. But they discover that their spacecraft has a broken part. And the only way for them to repair this is for NASA to send them a new part in a rescue and repair mission. But it takes NASA a fair amount of time to organize one of these missions and to complete it. So what if our astronauts don't have enough food, don't have enough water, and don't have enough oxygen to survive until this repair mission is completed? Well, if we had synthetic torpor as a tool, we could safely keep the astronauts out in space until this repair mission is completed. And then we could safely bring them back home to Earth. So this is just one of many examples about how studying hibernators and looking into synthetic torpor can improve and benefit space travel. From a human medicine perspective, uh, studying hibernators can provide insights into a safer alternative to hypo, uh, therapeutic hypothermia. So therapeutic hypothermia has been used for many, many years, um, and it's used to treat patients with severe injuries, such as trauma patients. And it's usually accomplished by packing down the patient with lots of ice to lower their body temperature, which then causes a decrease in their metabolism. And that's the end goal of therapeutic hypothermia, is to decrease their metabolism. Well, this treatment has a couple potential health complications. Decreasing the body temperature like that can lead to an irregular heartbeat, which can sometimes lead to a heart attack. Um, but you don't see this health complication in hibernators. And hibernation naturally accomplishes this decrease in metabolism in a controlled way. So studying hibernators can help us learn how this may be a safer alternative to therapeutic hypothermia. Another example for a human medicine application I have um, is to study the hibernator and their microbiome to learn about diseases that involve GI tract disuse. So an example is a treatment called total parenteral nutrition, or TPN. And this is used to treat patients who have a non-functioning GI tract or require complete bowel arrest. So instead of consuming food to get their nutrients, TPN patients will receive all of their nutrients intravenously. So in both TPN patients and hibernating animals, um, they don't use your GI tract um, for nutrient processing, which can lead to some health problems. As I mentioned earlier, the GI tract starts to degrade, the um, immune system is weakened. But in hibernators, some of these adverse health effects aren't seen. So studying hibernator microbiomes can help us understand how these microorganisms may play a role in preventing some of these health problems. So as I hope you realize now, um, studying hibernators and their microorganisms can provide us with so much knowledge that can be used to benefit space travel in human medicine. And I always find it amazing to think that these organisms are probably hiding and hibernating in our backyards right now. Um, so my hope is that you walk away tonight with a greater appreciation of the humble ground squirrel. Um, and that you recognize that hibernation is much more complex than sleep, and remember that we are all living in a symbiosis with our gut microbiome. Thank you for listening, and I'd love to discuss any questions you have. My name is Heather, and mm -hmm. I had a question about the synthetic torpor that you'd be putting astronauts in, and I know everything's theoretical, so right. um, I want exact answers now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you're reducing the amount of oxygen during that period, then you're reducing blood oxygen, which you're then reducing oxygen to the brain. Is that going to cause any sort of would it, do you think, cause any sort of brain damage? So yeah, that's, that's a great uh, question, Heather. Um, so in hibernators like the Arctic ground squirrel, which was the one that can drop their body temperature below freezing, um, we actually see that in torpor, um, their brain synapses or the connections in their brain actually degrade in torpor, um, partially because of the cold, partially because, yes, there's less oxygen available to keep those connections alive and present. Uh, but the crazy thing is that in these hibernators, when they enter an interbout arousal, those connections are reformed. 
So this, this would be based on the idea that if we could induce in synthetic torpor, it, we would try to mimic hibernation and torpor and hibernation as much as possible. So if we can understand how hibernators reform those brain connections, then we might be able to make the same thing happen in a human and try to minimize any damage that would happen to the brain caused by the synthetic torpor. Question back here. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering kind of about the brain too. Do animals that are in the deeper state of hibernation are their brains active? Are they dreaming? Or are they totally shut down? Um, and then do they, do we know, like, does the 13 line ground squirrel live longer than its next closest relative because it's spending part of its time in this state of torpor? All right, so, okay, there were a couple questions in there. Uh, does the brain still function during torpor? Um, and the answer to that is, is yes. So they still need, the squirrel isn't shutting down their body completely, right? It still needs to keep a couple things running to make sure that their body doesn't just completely degrade. Um, and when you look at a hibernating squirrel and you, say, use an um, infrared camera, a thermal imaging camera, um, you'll actually notice that their brain is slightly warmer than the rest of their body, which suggests that the brain is still functioning at some level. Um, the question about whether these squirrels are sleeping during torpor, um, that's actually a really interesting thing because in torpor, the squirrels are not experiencing, um, what is it called, deep sleep. So the, the stage of sleep where it's really restorative. I mean, one of the hypotheses out there as to why these interbout arousals occur is for the squirrels to actually complete like restorative, restful sleep. Um, so, no, sleep in torpor is different from the sleep that we experience, but when a squirrel goes into interbout arousal, the sleep that they experience then is more similar to the restorative sleep that we are used to. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't remember the third part of your question. They got a, a little longer uh, life because they spend part of their time in the state of torpor. Oh, okay. So do squirrels who hibernate and you use enter torpor, um, live longer than squirrels that do not live in torpor and or experience torpor. Um, and that I'm not sure about. Um, so these squirrels will naturally, like, okay, let's say we're talking about my 13 line ground squirrel. Um, they hibernate even without us doing anything to them. So even if we keep them in a room temperature room in October, they will hibernate regardless of what the temperature around them is. So I don't think there's a way that we could effectively test to see whether a squirrel that hibernates versus a squirrel that doesn't hibernate, if it's the same species, whether or not one lives longer than the other. Um, we could certainly do comparisons between, say, ground squirrels and tree squirrels that don't hibernate, um, but I don't know what the comparison between age for those two species are. Uh, what's the mortality rate for hibernators? Ooh, mortality rate. That is a good question. I'm guessing that they're asking about what the mortality rate during hibernation is. Um, and that I don't know. Um, yeah, that I'm not, I, I can say that our squirrels will pass away during hibernation. Um, usually it's not too many, but I don't know what the mortality rate is. Um, and I don't know of anyone who has tested that or looked for that before. Hi. Have you studied the microbiome of the ground squirrels in comparison to the ones that do not enter this torpor? Um, is the microbiome, obviously, there's many microbes that can't form endospores and ways of protecting and surviving that because of the drastic change. So have you, you guys studied that at all? Is, like, is there a difference between the microbiomes? Yeah, that I haven't studied before. We, we have tossed around ideas about studying that, though, because we were interested in the comparison. Um, but no, I haven't studied that. Um, I do know that people have done work looking at the microbiome of tree squirrels, uh, but I don't know off the top of my head just what those differences are compared to the squirrels that I study. Mm -hmm. Hi. If the um, squirrels are going into hibernation at room temperature, um, what are the triggers that are inducing the hibernation state? Yeah, that's a great question, um, and I don't have an answer for that because we as scientists, as hibernation biologists, don't know what the triggers are. Um, they're likely something internal, though. Um, like I mentioned, if they're at room temperature, the squirrels will still hibernate. Um, so we, we hypothesize that this has something to do with 
their own internal clock. Um, so they might have a clock that you know, tracks a yearly cycle, and once you know, they reach that point of their clock where they're like, okay, it's, I live in Wisconsin and it's October, this means that it's time to hibernate, that's when they enter it. But we don't know exactly what that trigger is, but it's probably something genetic and internal within the squirrels. Uh, years ago, I read a, a study on the Arctic ground squirrels in that arousal period. When they came up into a sleep state, uh, they were shown to be uh, entering a, a REM sleep state where they were dreaming. Yeah. And, the, and the question one of the uh, researchers asked was, are they coming awake to dream? Because we as human beings have mm. to dream. We have to, or we'll, we'll lose psychological function. So do animals need to dream. I, I've never read a, a follow-up to that, but I've always been very curious about that question. Yeah, that's a great question, um, and it's something that I've wondered myself. Um, so my, my personal guess would be that, yes, so part of that dream state is, is restorative REM cycle, and the squirrels need that restorative REM cycle in order you know, to keep their brain healthy, to keep their body healthy throughout hibernation. Um, so based on that, I would think that Yes, they need to dream, not necessarily for the dream experience itself, but for the restorative functions that that state of sleep has on their brain and on their body. Uh, so dovetailed on the trigger to cause them to go into hibernation and so forth, have you tried um, putting these squirrels in different latitudes and longitudes and different places to see if you can artificially make them not go into hibernation? Yeah, that's a great question. So I personally haven't done that, um, but there are hibernation scientists who have done that. Um, and they find that, um, like let's say if you take a ground squirrel from Wisconsin and you take it down south to Texas, where they also actually have the same ground squirrel in some areas there, um, the Wisconsin ground squirrel will still go into torpor or still start hibernating at the same time regardless of where they're located. Um, but it's also, I think, interesting to note that, say, like a Texan 13 line ground squirrel is going to hibernate at a different time compared to a Wisconsin ground squirrel. So it seems as though ground squirrels have adapted to their local environment of where they're located for them to know when it is during the year that they need to start hibernating. It doesn't matter exactly where, physically where they are located, but evolutionarily over time, they've they know when it's time for them to hibernate in their environment. Hi. You said that squirrel is like a large chipmunk? I mean, sort of looks yeah, like Yeah, it looks like an oversized large, chipmunk. Oversized. Well, and I've certainly had my a lot of company with of something that looks like that. And they were still running around quite a bit recently. Um, I did some live trapping, and they were right there ready to jump in and not be happy, but I took, them to, I took them way away to another woods somewhere, but I didn't give them to the neighbors. But uh, I just wanted to know, do they not all hibernate? Because they were very active. Right, so 13-line ground squirrels shouldn't wander out of their burrows. They normally just stay where they are and just stay inside their burrows for the full six months of hibernation. Um, chipmunks, however, are different. Um, so they hibernate, but they also store food. Mm -hmm. So when chipmunks enter and enter about arousal, they'll often leave their burrows and go to one of their food storage areas and then eat some food and then go back okay. into their, their burrows. So I, I'm wondering whether this, the um, squirrels or the rodent that you caught maybe was a type of chipmunk that mm -hmm. aroused um, and went to eat food and you caught it. Yeah. Yeah. So th that would be my guess. I'm fascinated by the issue of the genetics versus adaptation and the fact that the Texas squirrels uh, go into hibernation on their own schedule separate from the Wisconsin squirrels uh, while they are probably the genetically same species suggests that there is some adaptation rather than entirely genetic component to this. So I'm wondering if uh, you or others have looked at the genetics of the species that can hibernate and those that cannot to see if there are specific genes that control this and separately for species that are pretty close to each other but do or don't hibernate, are there any conditions that you can use that force the non-hibernators to start adapting by hibernating because it's a better way to get through a tough winter? 
yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the point about comparing the genetics or the genomes of, say, a hibernating ground squirrel versus a non-hibernating ground squirrel, or you know, comparing a Wisconsin squirrel to a Texan squirrel. Um, so it's, it's hard to do these types of experiments simply because it costs a lot of money and it uses a lot of resources to get a good quality genome, look at the genetics of these squirrels. Um, so, and we're not at that point yet. We don't have a good enough quality genome of these different types of squirrels to really, I think, make strong conclusions about what's there and what's not. Um, and I'm sorry, I forgot the second part of your question. Can you get a species that is not a hibernator but is genetically close to one that is? to be able to hibernate if you put them into conditions where it would be really in their best interest yes. to hibernate. Yes, um, and the answer to that is yes. So, so I mentioned earlier that you can think of hibernation as, and sleep as being in this continuum of changes in metabolism, right? Um, it's kind of similar to where sleep is on that side of the continuum. There are animals out there that will go into torpor when their environment becomes really cold. So mice are an example of this. Um, there are facultative hibernators, and mice included, that, you know, if it gets really cold or if they start running out of food, they will go into a state of torpor to conserve energy until their environment becomes a little bit more favorable, and then they'll stop hibernating. Um, and, there, and this use of torpor um, intermittently, um, either when the environment calls for it or maybe just for a short period of time every day, this is wide, widespread throughout all animals. Um, so this is something that you can find in a lot of species. Which, which is one of the reasons why we think that synthetic torpor might really be a possibility for humans. Because if so many diverse animals are able to go into their own form of torpor, regardless of what the environmental conditions are, that suggests that humans might also have this ability to do the same. We have another question online. Uh, a question from the Olson Library. Um, do the squirrels eat anything during their period when they're kind of awake? Mm -hmm. So the ground squirrels that I study, the 13 liners, they don't eat anything during their interbout arousals, but some hibernators do. Um, as I mentioned, chipmunks will eat uh, during their arousals. Um, some facultative hibernators, so like hamsters, for example, will hibernate when it gets really cold or when they run out of food. Hamsters will also eat when they wake up in an interbout arousal. So it, it's very species dependent. You said something about um, the money involved, and yes, it would be expensive for this kind of, of work. The point is for research, for space travel, for medicine, for uh, just to know how the squirrels are doing. I, I mean, I'm not being, it's a little facetious, but what is, uh, what is it, what's the point? The, the whole point of my research. Yes. yes, so so the point, the thing that I'm really interested in is understanding how the hibernator's microbiome is interacting with the host and how both of them are working together to enhance survival during hibernation. So I'm interested in the basic biology questions of how are they interacting with each other and how are they responding to these extreme changes in diet and physiology. Um, so my interest is from a basic bio perspective, but the applications are everything that you named off. By understanding these very fundamental, I shouldn't be saying basic bio, it's like fundamental microbiology questions. By understanding these um, fundamental um, interactions at play, you can't, you can't take applications to the point of space travel or human medicine without understanding the fundamentals of what's happening. So my hope is that my work is laying down some of these required um, I don't want to keep on using the word fundamental, but really laying down some base knowledge that other researchers can then build upon so that one day we can achieve applications in space travel and applications in human medicine. Uh, I was wondering if you could explain a little bit more about how the ground squirrels survive without drinking any liquid. It mm -hmm. seems more impressive to me than not eating any food for the months and months. Yeah. And I, I'm just curious how it works. Yes. So by decreasing metabolism, they're also decreasing the amount of water that they lose. Um, because, you know, when you're breathing um, and performing bodily functions, that requires a lot of water. Um, so decreasing metabolism is one way that they can conserve 
um, the water that they have left in their body. Um, I think a good example of this is that, so I've been talking about hibernation as it occurs during winter, but that's not the only time that hibernation occurs. You can have hibernating animals that occur in warmer climates, but they hibernate because of water loss. So maybe they're in a warmer climate and then there's a dry season and a drought. <coughs> So they need to conserve water. Um, this form of hibernation is called estivation, but it's doing the same thing as hibernating in winter, but the goal there is to conserve water rather than to conserve energy. Hi, I was wondering, you mentioned that the abundance decreased during hibernation. Uh, what about the diversity? Yep, diversity also decreases. Since we see such a huge die-off of microbes, a lot of microbes that that during the summer um, very readily used the food that the squirrel consumed as their source of energy, many of these microbes can't use those post-derived substrates. So we see a lot of those microbes die off, which decreases the diversity to mostly just the microbes that are able to metabolize those host-derived substrates. You mentioned two types of hibernating primates. I was just curious what those are. Yes, so there is the fat-tailed dwarf lemur found in Madagascar, and then there's also the pygmy slow loris, which is found in Vietnam. Um, and, and both of those, I'll mention, they, those are two examples of animals that hibernate in warmer climates, right? They hibernate because um, water is hard to find and they need to conserve water. Let's see, if cues are genetic and don't change their patterns in a different climate um, or region, how might they adapt to something like changing climate? Yeah, that's a really good question that I always wonder every year. Like I, I, last year, um, in Madison at least, I feel like during the spring we had this really weird warm, bloom of warm weather and all of a sudden it got cold again and we were all worried like, oh, what if the squirrels wake up? Um, and then how are they going to adapt to this? And I... I don't really have an answer to that. I'm not entirely sure how they will respond to changing climate and warmer climates um, and how that's going to affect their, their annual cycle of knowing when to hibernate and when to wake up. So I, I'm not sure, but that's research that I think is important and should be done. Um, a little departure from the ground squirrel, but uh, there are some species of whales that will fast for months without eating. And I know you don't see any whales in Lake Mendota, so you might not know the answer <laughs> yeah. to this, but uh, is there any correlation or similarity with hibernation or uh, metabolism going on when the whales are fasting during long periods of time? Ooh, I, that I don't know. I'm not sure what similarities there are in metabolism between a fasting animal versus a hibernating animal. But I, I do know that there are some similarities in how their microbiome response to fasting, at least. We see similar decreases in, um, so certain microbes that may die off in hibernators because they can't adapt to the fasting aspect of hibernation. We see similar microbes die off in animals that fast for long periods of time. But from a metabolism standpoint, I'm not sure what the differences are. Uh, I've heard of people whose like hearts stopped and then they lower their body temperature way, way down. How is are they putting them into hibernation, or is that something totally different? Just lowering that body temperature lowering. way down. Um, so if, so it makes sense that their body temperature would decrease, would drop if their heart stops, because that means that metabolism isn't occurring anymore. So I think the body temperature drops as a result of their heart stopping. Oh, okay. um, does that answer your question? I think so. Or am I imagining? I thought that they put some people, they reduced it way, way down. Oh, it's an induced coma. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, induced coma. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Um, I'm, not, I'm not super clear on the differences between an induced coma versus hibernation, um, but usually if the goal of a medical treatment is to decrease metabolism, um, you'll, you'll often see side effects like, like, like you know, an irregular heartbeat, heart attack, or... Um, or a degradation of muscle during that period when the patient isn't moving. Um, so those are some health complications that we hope that learning about synthetic torpor can help fix. Um, but the difference, the main difference, I guess, would be that a hibernator, um, so a hibernator decreases their metabolism first, and that's what causes body temperature to decrease. 
Um, in other cases, like in therapeutic hypothermia, although I'm not sure what it is for a coma, um, the goal is to, they will decrease body temperature, and then that causes the decrease in metabolism. So it's kind of the order of which one comes first. And if you decrease metabolism first, and then that causes the decrease in body temperature, that's what we think causes fewer health problems. How far away are we from uh, human testing? <laughs> pretty, pretty far away, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, we have frogs in the North Woods that hibernate, and say spring peeper, for instance, will dig down three inches in the forest duff. What's always intrigued me is that they freeze in, in large part 50% or so body mass freezes. Is anybody studying frogs, snakes, reptiles in Madison? Yeah. And, and, and one other question along that line is, is what I've read is that the brain activity is non-existent for frogs and for turtles during hibernation. There is no brain measurable activity. So I'm just curious if I'm out of my mind, which is common, but uh, <laughs> if that's the case. Yeah, um, so uh, as far as brain activity in these hibernating amphibians, I can't say any, anything on that because I simply don't know. Um, but as for how these amphibians are able to do that, we do have researchers at Wisconsin who are studying this. Um, so some grad students that work for Dr. Um, Warren Porter, in, who works in the Department of Integrative Biology, is actually doing an experiment on hibernating frogs. Um, and they're able to hibernate because they do something called supercooling. And what their cells do is, I guess, this is specifically for the, um, the species of frog that I know that uh, my colleague studies. But these frogs will actually really quickly expel the water out of their cells as to minimize the ice crystals that might form and break apart their cells. Um, so that's how, th so the mechanism that they use to hibernate is a little bit different than the ones that our mammalian ground squirrels use to hibernate, um, but they accomplish the same goal. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know what exactly changes in their brain compared to hibernating mammals. I noticed that there's a number of physicians in the audience, and I was wondering if any one of them cared to comment in regard to the induced coma. Yeah, I'd love to hear. Any takers? Anyone? Please. I'd love to learn more. I guess not. Oh. oh. There's one down past you. If an animal were uh, encountered or threatened while they were hibernating, can they react? Do they have a reaction time, or are they just, they're done? Yeah, they're, they're a little out of luck, unfortunately. Um, I, I, I wish I had, a, I had a video or a way to show you guys, but um, when, like, when you look at a hibernating ground squirrel and you, know, you gently pick them up, um, they feel like a rock. Like they're very cold. There's, there's little response. Like you know, if, you, if you gently pick them up, they'll kind of move a tiny bit. Um, but if it was a predator looking to eat them, they would stand no chance. Um, but also... Um, they're very well hidden. Um, so a fun story that I have, not about me specifically, but there were some researchers um, back in the 1920s who they wanted to study these wild ground squirrels. Um, so they were like, okay, it's winter. We're going to go out and try to find the burrows of these ground squirrels, and we're going to try to dig them up. Well, they published a paper on this saying, like, this really was almost impossible. Please don't try this ever again because you can't find the burrows. Um, and the burrows are going through frozen ground. Right? So trying to dig that up is also incredibly difficult. So I think if a predator can successfully find and dig up a hibernating animal, I think that predator deserves a little bit of credit for all the work that he or she has been through. Hi. I came with a question specific to bears, but maybe you can say if it's relatable to squirrels or whatever. But I had heard that mama bears are impregnated before they hibernate. Mm -hmm. Um, and then they come out with their cubs. So I was wondering if you could speak to that in any context. Yeah, so um, I don't know the specific details of exactly what happens. But yeah, bears will give birth while they're hibernating. Um, and that's honestly really about all that I can say 
say, say to that. I don't know specifically what happens, but it is kind of mind-blowing that even in torpor, they're able to still give birth and, you know, take care of their pups. Do you have more to add? Yeah. Or cubs. Cubs. Go ahead. I can add one quick thing. Uh, they do delayed implantation, so they, they breed in July and midsummer, but don't implant the egg until they go into hibernation. Oh. So and then have and then have these little walnut-sized babies, eight ounce. So anyone, any woman who's had a baby, it's really not fair. Uh, they, <laughs> and you know, and the average now is uh, three or four twin or triplets and or uh, quads, because uh, bears are doing so well. So, and so they all nurse and nurse. Anyway, it's fascinating, but it's delayed implantation. Okay. All right. Thank you. Another question here. I was just talking about bears, and of course, there's a lot of research done on them, and uh, where they go in and and uh, disturb the, the the hibernating bears, and um, what is what impact does that have on this natural process um, uh, when they're artificially disturbed? Um, so I think that depends a little bit on exactly what is being done to them during this disturbance. Um, as I mentioned earlier, when these animals are hibernating, they're, you know, they're really out of it. They're not responding a lot to external um, influences or external cues to them. Um, so I think it depends on exactly what they're, they're doing to a bear. I think if it's just something minor, like in my case, you know, you might be collecting a fecal sample for microbiome sampling. That's usually a, a pretty low disturbance, so it would probably cause minimal disturbance to a hibernating animal. If they're doing something more intense, like a blood draw or something like that, I would imagine that that would influence the animal and maybe cause them to wake up a little bit before going back into torpor, which would then absolutely disturb their natural hibernation cycle. Hi. Um, I just, I'm just amazed by you, when you're talking about the amphibians actually kind of able to spell some water and uh, freezing part, part of their body. And uh, um, what, do you, what do, could you tell us about uh, those uh, uh, turtles and uh, snakes when, because they're cold-blooded and uh, they can't really control their own body temperature? Like how close could they get to actually frozen? And what if uh, the climate that they couldn't predict, their brew wasn't deep enough, they actually start getting into the frozen state, can they actually um, defrost and uh, wake up? Because I, I, I heard even in science fiction that um, if you freeze an animal or anything, like the defrozing process is very tricky. Not everyone can actually wake up, but uh, because they they actually is cold-blooded. It's not like they can actually control um, and maintain a low body temperature without frozen. Yeah, those are all really great questions. Um, and unfortunately, I, I don't study amphibians, so it's really hard for me to know how to answer those questions simply because I'm not familiar with amphibians and reptiles um, that hibernate. But you bring up a really good point, which is something that I should have probably talked about, which is the fact that these animals are cold-blooded, right? Um, and so cold-blooded animals um, don't actually hibernate. So if we're talking about the term of hibernation and what it actually refers to, it is often used to refer to a controllable and reversible change in metabolism, which then causes a change in body temperature. So, and this, and if you take hibernation to mean this definition, this means that amphibians and reptiles can't hibernate because they aren't able to control their own body temperature. Um, so that's part of the reason why I unfortunately can't answer your questions is because in my field, amphibians and reptiles aren't really considered hibernators. They do something very similar to what hibernation accomplishes, um, but the mechanisms are different. And because of that, I unfortunately don't know enough to answer your questions. I guess I'm just interested in um, how you mimic hibernation in your lab. Like how many squirrels do you keep and how do mm -hmm. you create their burrows and what right. does that look like? Yeah, um, so for, uh, for us, um, for our squirrels, uh, I think I mentioned this earlier, but they will start hibernating without any influence from us. Um, so we just keep them you know, in cages that are padded nicely with um, soft bedding for them. Um, and they'll start you know, practicing going into hibernation in September and go into hibernation at the end of September, beginning of October without us doing anything. But we do something to help 
facilitate that process by trying to mimic their natural habitats. So what we do is we, when the squirrels are hibernating, we keep them in a dark, cold room that's at four degrees Celsius. And I'm, oh yeah, four degrees Celsius would be 39 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so we keep them in a dark, cold room to try to mimic what their natural habitat would look like. But even without doing any of that, the squirrels would hibernate regardless. A question online? Uh, yeah, actually it's my question, not even online. <laughs> <laughs> So um, last Science on Tap, we had a, guy, uh, a person talking about bats. And uh, a lot of bats that live in caves are suffering from white nose syndrome. And the reason that they're dying is because they're being awakened from their hibernation. Can you talk about that at all? And um, are there any other diseases that affect animals by waking them up from hibernation? Yeah, OK. So um, that's a great answer. And I, I love talking about the bats um, because I think they're, they're such a cool organism. Um, so how white nose syndrome works, because I don't know the specifics of, of what the bat experts said, but white nose syndrome occurs because the bats are infected with um, a fungus, and that fungus can grow at the low body temperature that occurs when the bats are in torpor. Um, and that's how, these, these, how this disease manifests in these bats. Um, but so when an animal is in torpor, its immune system is, is weakened, right? Metabolism is low, so it, it just can't turn on that immune system without increasing its metabolism. And that's why those bats will go into an interbout arousal, because doing so can activate their immune system and try to fight um, the, the fungus that's causing this disease. Um, but if a bat has to arouse too many times, it burns through those fat stores so quickly that it doesn't survive the winter. And that's what causes the mortality in the bats, is because they're arousing so often to try and fight this fungus that they run out of energy and they can't survive towards the end of winter. Um, so that's one fungal disease that I know affects hibernators. Um, another one that it doesn't affect hibernators because it affects snakes, and snakes are cold-blooded, so they can't hibernate. Um, but, but there is a similar fungal disease that affects snakes when, you know, when they overwinter during the cold weather. Um, and what happens in that disease, I'm not clear about the specifics, but I do know that the snakes do something similar to what the bats try to do. So this fungus that affects the snakes also is able to grow at low temperatures. So the snake needs to try to increase its body temperature. But it's cold-blooded, so how does it accomplish that? Well, snakes will come out of their burrows and lay on, onto a rock in the sun to try to let the sun increase their body temperature and kill off the fungus. But oftentimes, this results in the snake being eaten by, say, a bird of prey um, or some other animal. But that's another example of a disease that I know of, um, although a little different because snakes can't hibernate. But those are the only two that I'm familiar with. What kind of uh, a heart rate or respiratory rate are we talking about in the hibernating ground squirrel? Yes, so in our 13 line ground squirrels, they breathe one to two times a minute when they're in torpor, um, and heart rate is only about two to three times a minute as well. So you can see that. So you know, I used the analogy earlier of torpor being like turning down the thermostat, right? Well, I also like to think of torpor as putting the squirrel into a really slow motion video because everything slows down. Heart rate, sl heart rate slows down, and respiration rate also slows down. Oh, normal heart rate. I should know this off the top of my Oh, yes. Um, when they're resting, it's around 120 beats per minute. And when they're active and, and like, you know, running around, it can get up to 213 beats per minute. So we're dropping from, you know, an average of maybe 150 beats down to just two or three when they're in torpor. Um, mm -hmm. Now, you said that the ground squirrels would go into hibernation even when they're not in their right situation. Well, what about if they're bringing their body temperature down to like 39 and it's not that cold? Oh, yes. Um, so the, the temperature at which their body temperature drops to is slightly dependent on the, the ambient temperature, the temperature of you know, the air, the environment around them. Um, because the goal is for them to conserve energy, right? So if they're at a room temperature room and they try to drop their body temperature to 39 degrees Celsius, or 39 degrees Fahrenheit, sorry, scientists think in Celsius, gotta, gotta convert. Um, 
Um, that will actually cause them to increase their metabolism because they're trying to keep their body temperature that low. Um, so exactly how low their body temperature drops is somewhat dependent on the environment around them. Um, but the lowest it'll drop in a 13-line ground squirrel is that 39. Um, what is the weight of the adult squirrel going into hibernation versus him waking in the spring? Okay, uh, so adult squirrels going into hibernation, it depends on whether you're talking about males or females because males tend to be larger. Um, but going into hibernation, a male can be over 200 grams. A female might be like around 170 to 190. Um, and when they come out in spring, females can get as low as around 70, 80 grams. Um, and males will drop down to usually around 100 or so. Sorry, just a, the, the follow-up question on that. Um, so when their surrounding temperature is higher, like say they hibernate because they can trying to save water, and you're saying their body temperature will not drop as low, um, what's, what's their heart rate and the breath rate compared to the one in the colder climate? Mm. That I am not, excuse me, that I'm not entirely sure about, but if I had to make an educated, an educated guess, I would guess that if, if they are effectively lowering their metabolism down to, like, to around 4% of their normal metabolism, their heart rate and their, um, their breathing rate should stay the same because metabolism is at the same level. The body temperature can just be a result of what the ambient temperature is. Um, that would be my educated guess, but I don't know entirely if that is what happens. Another question online? Mm -hmm. yeah. One more question online. Do any birds hibernate? Yeah, great question. The common poor will found um, in the plains of the United States. That is the only bird that truly hibernates. A lot of birds will employ uh, daily torpor. So as I mentioned before, we're talking about this continuum of changes in metabolism. Um, some birds will go into torpor for a couple of hours each day to conserve energy, um, but the common poor will is the only one that does um, hibernation where it goes into torpor for multiple days at a time. So a poor will like a whipper will sort of um, related? I'm not entirely sure what a whipper will okay. is. Yes. Our yes. bird person yes. says yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I was wondering if you have found any triggers to the arousal uh, that, that you mentioned during, during the torpor, mm -hmm. and uh, can you, as in the lab, sort of induce that? If so, like. triggers for arousal, I don't know of any triggers that are, say, internal, you know, like maybe um, a compound or a metabolite maybe builds up and lets the squirrel know that it's time to wake up. That's been tested before and we haven't found, well, we being hibernation biologists haven't found anything yet. Um, but you can induce arousal in a squirrel by moving it from, in our case, we move it from our cold room to a normal room temperature room and that will induce arousal. Um, not a question, but something related to what, what, was, just asked, what was just asked. Mm -hmm. Um, brown bears will arouse based on if another animal is killed and they can smell it, oh. they'll wake up and they'll go eat on it. Oh, really? And, um, and then back to the question about are they, um, and I know they're not, um, doing anything with humans for hibernation. And the study of the things that you've looked at, my understanding is we're planning trips in the future by new private companies in the U.S. about going to Mars but humans can't get to Mars without, unless they can figure out the hibernation part of it. Yeah, exactly. Um, so first, thank you for sharing the facts about the bears. I clearly need to read more about our large hibernators. Um, and as far as get, achieving getting humans to Mars, yeah, you're absolutely correct. The, um, I don't know how long it takes to get to Mars. It's a long time, though, and to carry enough food, water, and oxygen for our astronauts to complete that trip and make sure that they're arriving to Mars in a healthy state that is a challenge that we're trying to overcome. Any other questions? Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much, Edna. Thank you.
Thanks again. Uh, thanks again to our sponsors, Monaco Public Library, the Lakeland Badger Chapter, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, Camp Natural Resources, Trout Lake Station, our hosts here, Monaco Brewing Company, and uh, remember that our funding comes from the Brittingham Fund, very generous. Our next Science on Tap is February 6th, and our speaker will be talking about uh, pumping water for agriculture um, down in the central sands. Please sign up on the clipboard at the exit and give us some suggestions for future topics. And have a great month. We'll see you next month. Thank you very much. Thank you, Edna.